The plane had been in the air for a mere 25 seconds when the pilots noticed weird noises and bizarre vibrations. They tried several ways to improve the situation, but nothing worked. The engine surges continued. And just over a minute into the flight, when the plane reached 3,000 feet, both engines failed. First the right one, two seconds later the left one. The pilots decided to return to the airport they had just left. At the same time, they tried to restart the engines. Nothing seemed to work. The flight crew made a decision to pitch the plane down and then level it off. Perhaps it could help them gain some speed for the glide. But soon, they realized they wouldn't make it to the airport. Was the plane going to crash? That's when the miracle at Gotrura occurred. The morning before the flight started as usual. Regular pre-flight procedures, good weather. The members of the flight crew were experienced pilots. A 44-year-old Danish captain with over 8,000 flight hours under his belt and a 34-year-old first officer from Sweden with 3,000 hours. So, what could go wrong? The plane itself was almost brand new. It was a McDonnell Douglas MD-81, nicknamed Dana Viking. It made its first flight on March 16, 1991. By that fateful day, the aircraft had been in service for a mere nine months. There were 122 passengers and seven crew members on board. Flight 751 Scandinavian Airlines was a scheduled flight from Stockholm, Sweden to Warsaw, Poland. On the way, the plane was supposed to make a stop in Copenhagen, Denmark. The aircraft took off from Stockholm according to its schedule at 8.47 a.m. local time. But by that point, the people inside had already been doomed, all because of a terrible sequence of events before the departure. It started the night before. The plane arrived at Stockholm Airport after a flight from Zurich. It was 10.09 p.m. The aircraft spent the night at the gate outside. It was cold. The temperature dropped to 34 degrees Fahrenheit, just above freezing. What made the situation even worse was that almost 6,000 pounds of freezing cold fuel, chilled during the night, still remained in the tanks located in the wings. The fuel was so cold because the plane had been flying at the cruising altitude, where the air temperature outside the cabin varied from minus 61 to minus 80 degrees. The flight from Zurich lasted around 1 hour and 40 minutes. Soon after midnight, a flight technician came to check on the aircraft. The man had to remove some slush from the landing gear, otherwise he wouldn't be able to examine it. At around 2 a.m., when he was leaving, he noticed some ice covering the upper part of the wings. By the morning, the situation had become even dire. A layer of clear, almost invisible ice had formed on the tops of the wings. The plane had to leave the gate at around 8.30 a.m. An hour before the departure, the mechanic responsible for the plane noticed that some ice covered the underside of the wings. He decided to make sure there was no ice on the tops of the wings. He climbed a ladder and put one knee on the wing. Then he bent forward to touch the front part of the wing. There was no ice, just some slush. The mechanic decided to make sure everything was fine with the air inlet of one of the engines. He didn't find anything abnormal. Soon after that, the personnel used more than 220 gallons of de-icing fuel to remove ice from the plane. The mechanic consulted with the captain of the aircraft and ordered the staff to de-ice the underside of the wings as well. After all, he had seen some ice there. But no one thought to double-check if there was clear ice on the tops of the wings. After they had finished the procedure, the mechanic reported to the captain, uh, We're done here. The icing finished. There was a lot of snow and ice, but everything's clear now. The captain thanked the mechanic and carried on with the pre-flight procedures. The plane taxied to the runway. Its engine's anti-ice systems were switched on and didn't show any malfunction. But several passengers later claimed they had seen ice sliding off the upper side of the wings while the plane had been taking off. And still, the plane left the ground and headed for Stockholm as usual. But shortly after the takeoff, several pieces of the overlooked ice broke off. At full speed, they slammed into the fans of the engines near the tail on both sides of the plane, ruining the blades. It led to a series of surges, and the rest is history. 
Meanwhile, somewhere in the cabin, Scandinavian Airlines flight captain Per Holmberg, who was on board as a passenger, noticed something was amiss. At first, he informed the flight attendant sitting in the rear jump seat that the right engine was surging. She tried to contact the flight crew, unsuccessfully. Then, the ununiformed captain rushed to the cockpit and asked if he could help the pilots. The first officer gave him the emergency checklist, and the captain asked him to start the auxiliary power unit, a small gas turbine in the tail of the plane. Holmberg's advice and help were invaluable, but was it enough to save the plane and the people inside? When the plane emerged from the cloud cover at an altitude of 890 feet, the pilots realized they wouldn't have enough time to make it back to the airport. An immediate emergency landing was unavoidable. The assisting captain passed the order to the cabin crew, and they started preparing the passengers. There was a large field to the north of the plane, but the captain realized they didn't have enough time to reach it. So he chose a much smaller field in a forested area in the direction of flight. It was not far from the village of Gotrura in upland Sweden. The plane was just 1,300 feet above the ground when the assisting captain started extending the flaps. At a height of 183 feet, the captain reported to Stockholm Control, we're crashing to the ground. Seven seconds later, the plane hit several trees and lost a huge chunk of its right wing. By that time, the landing gear had already been extended and the speed had decreased to 139 miles per hour. Moments later, the plane's tail struck the ground and broke off. The aircraft kept sliding across the field, still at high speed. It traveled 360 feet, with its main landing gear leaving marks on the field. At one point, the plane lost the main and nose landing gear. Its fuselage broke into three parts. Miraculously, there was no fire. If you look at the pictures from the crash site, the plane torn into pieces, with its parts scattered across the field, it's hard to believe that all 129 people on board the plane survived. It seems like a miracle. But it was also thanks to the flight attendant's quick reaction and the correct instructions they gave the passengers. They didn't panic and told the people to adopt the brace position just in time to avoid fatalities. Even more surprising, almost all passengers, except for four people, made their way out of the plane on their own. No wonder this accident was nicknamed the Miracle. The aircraft, though, wasn't as lucky. The nine-month-old plane was damaged so badly that it was an immediate write-off. Everyone praised the actions of the flight crew. The landing was incredibly skilled, especially in such a fast-developing, very dangerous situation. The captain himself admitted that few pilots were ever forced to put to the test the skills they got during training at least not to this degree. He said he was proud of his crew and relieved that everyone had survived. And he never returned to piloting commercial planes. February 2nd, 1970. We're at an Air Force base in Montana. Today, the 71st Fighter Interceptor Squadron plans to hold a training sortie. Four pilots get into jet planes and take off. Shortly, one of the pilots accidentally activates the braking parachute. A fabric dome shoots out of the plane. It's filled with air and interrupts the flight of the aircraft. The pilot has to land. The other three pilots continue the training. They arrive at the designated place and begin to simulate an air fight. Every pilot is a professional in his field. They have undergone similar training many times. But something amazing is going to happen today. The pilot of one plane, Major Curtis, must fight with two other planes. One of the Major's opponents is Captain Faust. Two planes are chasing the target. Major Curtis turns his jet and directs it straight upwards. The other two planes follow suit. The Major performs a maneuver, vertical rolling scissors. He flies up in a spiral while simultaneously making a barrel roll. Then he turns around and flies down, performing a dive. The pursuers are not far behind. Major Curtis makes another aerial maneuver. He goes to the side and flies past Captain Faust. At this moment, the captain's plane begins to shake. Its front part lowers and the jet hurtles to the ground at great speed. Captain Faust can't do anything. The plane doesn't listen to him. The control stick doesn't work. The engine's breaking down. The captain activates the braking parachute, but that doesn't work either. 
The plane is getting closer and closer to the ground. It can no longer be saved. Now it's important to save at least Captain Faust's life. He ejects and opens the parachute. Suddenly, the abandoned plane starts to fly straight. The flaps on the wings are activated and it stops falling down. The plane without a pilot flies and slowly descends. It goes at a speed of 200 miles per hour and disappears from sight behind the cliffs. Captain Faust lands safely on a snow-covered field. The other pilots see this and are afraid the plane will fall in a nearby town. They immediately head in that direction. At the time, the unguided aircraft descends, touches the ground, and slides along the field. Next, it makes a 20-degree turn and breaks through a small fence. The plane stops at a farmer's field. The owner of the farm calls the local sheriff. The sheriff arrives and calls the nearest military base to report what happened. He approaches the fallen plane to assess the damage and turn off the humming engine. But as soon as he gets closer, the plane begins to hum and shake as if it wants to escape from there. The plane owners arrive. They are surprised because the plane is in almost perfect condition. They deliver it back to the base, repair it, and return it to service. In 2016 in Belgium, a train was traveling without a driver. That day, people at two railway stations saw a train slowly moving between them. It didn't make any stops, brake, or accelerate. It was just slowly riding onwards. Passengers couldn't contact the driver and get out of the vehicle because no one was controlling the train at the time. Panic was rising. People began to say that a ghost train without a driver appeared. But the truth turned out to be not so mysterious. The empty passenger train had been leaving the station according to the schedule when the driver noticed some kind of malfunction. He stopped the train and got out of the cabin to see what happened. But for some reason, the train started again by itself and the driver didn't have time to jump on it. Fortunately, everything ended well. The driver warned all his colleagues about the runaway train. Everyone was evacuated from the train stations. Then, at some station, one brave driver jumped into the cabin right on the move and stopped the stray train. Speaking of ghost trains, you can see such things in the UK. They pass through railway stations that have long been abandoned. If you get on such a train, you'll probably be the only passenger. Authorities let these trains drive because it's economically profitable for the country. To cancel the route of a ghost train, you need to go through a lot of bureaucratic procedures and spend tons of extra money. So they travel all over the country and don't bother anyone. Now we go to the ocean to learn about the ship that was drifting for several months without its captain. The ship's called Alta. It was bought by a new owner in 2017 and marked with the flag of Tanzania. Almost all cargo ships are equipped with AIS, Automatic Identification System. That's a navigation system that works on the principle of GPS. All vessels are equipped with AIS, so their movement in the ocean can be tracked. This feature was disabled for the Alta. The ship disappeared from the satellite's eyes and reappeared several times. In 2017, it sailed by Greek port cities. The Alta made 12 stops in three such towns in different parts of Greece. Then the AIS signal disappeared. 10 months later, the Alta appeared again on the northern coast of Africa. In September 2018, it was headed to Haiti. During this trip, the ship's engine failed. The nearest shore was far away. The ship began to drift. A few days passed. The crew couldn't repair the vessel. The food supply was almost out. The situation was getting worse as a strong hurricane was approaching the place where the ship broke down. Fortunately, a rescue boat came to the sailors. They were all evacuated shortly before the hurricane hit. The Alta stayed drifting in the ocean. After a while, another ship came to tow it to the coast of Guiana. But something went wrong. Somebody stole the Alta. It's unknown who did it and why. Then, almost one year passed. In the waters of the Atlantic Ocean, a British Navy ship notices the drifting Alta. There's no one on board. No one controls it. Then, almost six months later, a resident of a small town in Ireland sees the abandoned ship off the coast. Somehow, the Alta was able to cover the distance across the Atlantic and wash up on the coast of Ireland. 
The Irish authorities said it had been a miracle that no one else saw the ship. It sailed calmly for such a long distance, surviving storms. They started an investigation to establish the owner of the vessel. It's important to find a responsible person who will tow off the Alta. It's extremely difficult to do so, though. They didn't find the owner. One day, an unknown person called the Irish authorities and introduced themselves as the proprietor of the Alta, but didn't provide any evidence. But the record for the longest drifting vessel along the ocean belongs to the SS Bechimo. People were seeing this ghost ship at different times for 38 years. It was a merchant ship owned by a Canadian trading company. In 1931, the ship got blocked by ice off the coast of Alaska. A strong snowstorm began. The crew waited a week for the bad weather to end, but the storm only intensified. One day, when the storm subsided a bit, part of the crew went to the nearest town. The rest of the crew members and the captain set up camp near the vessel. The storm didn't stop for a long time. The blizzard was so strong that people couldn't see beyond their stretched hands. Finally, when the storm was over, the captain went to find the ship. And couldn't. He decided it sank during the snowfall. A week later, the ship was found, drifting near the place where it was lost. Its hull was damaged so badly that it was unsafe to sail on it. The captain decided to abandon the vessel. However, it didn't sink. For the next 38 years, it was seen drifting at various points along the coast of Alaska. The last time people saw the frozen ship stuck in the ice was in 1969. In 2006, a special project was created to find SS Bechimo. However, in all these years, they've found nothing. Its fate is still unknown. It's likely the ship found peace on the seabed of the Chukchi Sea. You've probably seen Hollywood movies where somehow a small hole opens up in the side of a plane and then immediately it's utter chaos. Food trays and bags flying, seat belts barely holding passengers in place. Luckily, in reality, small damage to the fuselage won't cause such dramatic consequences. But would you believe me if I told you there was a pilot that managed to land a plane with half the roof torn completely off? Buckle up. At 1.25 p.m., on April 28, 1988, a 19-year-old Boeing 737 that belonged to Aloha Airlines left Hilo International Airport and headed for Honolulu. The plane was named after Queen Lilio Kalani, who was the last sovereign monarch of the Kingdom of Hawaii. On that day, the aircraft already had three short flights from Honolulu to Hilo, Maui, and Kauai. Apologies to the people of Hawaii for any mispronounced names. Anyway. All the trips were regular and uneventful. The weather was calm, and it seemed like nothing could go wrong. The captain was experienced pilot Robert Shorns Timer, 44 years old, who had 6,700 flight hours in the Boeing 737. The first officer was Madeline Tompkins, 36 years old, who had flown more than 3,500 hours in the very same Boeing model. Early in the morning, still in Honolulu, the first officer had conducted the regular pre-flight inspection and announced that the plane was ready for the flight. At 11 a.m., the plane left Honolulu and headed for Maui and then to Hilo. When the plane arrived at the destination, the pilots didn't leave the cockpit or inspect the aircraft from the outside. After all, it wasn't a requirement, so they didn't have to. Following schedule, the plane started the last leg on the routine round trip at 1.25 p.m. There were 95 people on board the aircraft, 89 passengers, two pilots, three flight attendants, and an FAA traffic controller who stayed in the observer seat in the cockpit. After a normal takeoff and ascent, the plane got to the usual cruising altitude of 24,000 feet, and then, at about 1.48 p.m., 26 miles away from Kaolui, the unexpected happened. Those who were in the cockpit heard a loud whooshing sound and then a crack, followed by the deafening sound of wind seconds later. Apparently, a small part of the roof on the left side tore loose, which led to the explosive decompression of the plane. But the worst thing was that the decompression caused a ripple effect, which led to a huge section of the airplane's roof to tear off completely. The length of the missing part was 18.5 feet long. It was all part of the aircraft's skin that covered the plane from the cockpit back to the four-wing area. At first, the pilots didn't realize what had happened. 
the first officer, who was in control of the aircraft at that moment, felt her head jerk backward, and she noticed debris and gray pieces of insulation flying chaotically around the cockpit. When the captain turned his head, he saw that the cockpit door had disappeared, and instead of the first-class ceiling, he was staring at a clear blue sky. The plane started to roll from side to side, and it was becoming increasingly harder to control. Everybody who was in the cockpit immediately put on their oxygen masks, and the captain took over the aircraft. He prod the speed brakes into action, and began an emergency descent towards the nearest airport, which was on Maui Island. Luckily, all the passengers were in their seats at the moment when the accident happened, and since the seatbelt sight was still on, everyone had their seatbelts fastened. However, all three flight attendants were standing along the aircraft aisle. The one who was the closest to the front of the plane was swept out through the hole in the roof. The other two were thrown to the floor by a forceful jerk. But while one of them hit her head really hard and lost consciousness, the other one started to crawl along the aisle in an attempt to help passengers and calm them down. At that same time, the pilots were trying to contact air traffic control and signal an emergency. To make matters worse, they couldn't hear each other and had to use gestures to communicate. They also didn't know whether the radio worked and whether they had managed to deliver their message. The flight controls were sluggish and loose, and the captain was struggling to control the plane. The first officer, right by his side, dealing with communication and assisting the captain. It turned out that the controller hadn't been receiving the crew's messages until the aircraft descended to the altitude of 14,000 feet. Only then did the signal get through, and Maui Tower started urgent preparations for an emergency landing. The problem was that at that time, in case of an emergency, the airport control tower had to dial 911 just like anyone else. On top of that, the controller didn't catch that the passengers and crew members would need medical help. After all, the crew only announced that they had experienced a rapid decompression, so the controller wasn't aware of the entire gravity of the situation. In the meantime, the plane had already dropped to a height of 10,000 feet above sea level. The captain removed his oxygen mask and withdrew the speed brakes. The plane was steadily descending toward runway 2 of Kaolui Airport. Following the captain's command, the first officer lowered the landing gear, but the indicator light didn't come on. That could mean that either they had a bad light, or they had serious problems with the nose gear. But that wasn't the only problem. As the plane was approaching the runway, the left engine failed, and the aircraft started rocking and shaking. The captain made an attempt to restart the engine, but didn't succeed. And yet still, with the help of the reverse thrust of the second still-working engine, at 1.58 p.m., just 10 minutes after the emergency and 35 minutes after the takeoff, Aloha Airlines Flight 243 did manage to touch down on the runway of Kaolui Airport and come to a complete stop. Landing a plane with such a huge loss of integrity was an unprecedented feat. As soon as the plane stopped, the evacuation began. Everyone on the plane, except for the one flight attendant who had been pulled out of the plane, was alive, although 65 people were injured. Most people had been hurt by flying debris and torn pieces of fuselage. Unfortunately, since nobody on the ground had known how serious the situation was, no ambulances were waiting for the injured. The first one arrived seven minutes after the plane landed, and there were only two ambulances on the entire island, which obviously couldn't fit all the people. That's why the passengers had to be transported to the hospital in several 15-passenger tour vans that belonged to the company Akamai Tours. Luckily, two Akamai drivers used to be paramedics, so they started to tend to the injured right on the runway. Meanwhile, airport mechanics, as well as office staff, drove the vans to the hospital, which was three miles away. Luckily, there were only eight serious injuries, from which all of these passengers later recovered. As for the plane, it was damaged beyond repair and later dismantled right at the airport. The missing part of the roof disappeared and was never seen again. But what could cause such a terrible accident? The problem wasn't the age of the aircraft. 19 years isn't that old for a commercial plane. And it hadn't accumulated too many flight hours before the accident happened. But the 35,500 flight hours the plane had traveled included 89,680 takeoffs and landings, which are also called flight cycles. 
The reason for such a huge number was that the plane performed mostly short domestic flights between the islands. And this number exceeded the number of flight cycles the plane was designed for twice over. Besides, the plane traveled in a salty and humid environment, which also added to the wear and tear. Interestingly, during one interview that followed the accident, passenger Gail Yamamoto remembered that she had spotted a crack in the fuselage when she was boarding. Unfortunately, she was the only one who had seen the damage, and the woman hadn't thought that the crack was important enough to inform the crew. It's important to stress that these kinds of accidents are extremely rare these days. According to Harvard University, given all the steps and measures major airlines and airports take to ensure safety, the odds of you being in an airplane accident is roughly 1 in 1.2 million. That's a 0.000083% chance. I don't know about you, but I like those odds. And even if something were to happen, like, for example, half the roof falling off, it's a great comfort to know that your trained pilots can still land the plane relatively safely. Joseph Walker is about to have an historic flight, but he does not know of it yet. He smiles at his chase pilot, showing the OK sign, and closes the cockpit of his steel friend, the newest unpowered rocket plane, X-15. It's placed under the wing of a B-52 bomber. They take off and go up to 45,000 feet. Joseph is calm and full of joy because he has been getting ready for this moment his whole life. He trusts his steel-winged friend like no other. The bomber drops the X-15. The rockets fire up, and with a fantastic thrust, Joe flies steeply toward the edge of space. He knows his dream of making the first-ever suborbital plane flight will soon come true. Joe adjusts the controls to intensify the rocket energy. In contrast to the usual blue-sky plane view, the beautiful curved planet Earth view and a black horizon is a visual privilege only a few people can have. Joseph Walker's reaction shows he is experiencing zero gravity. Welcome to space, the pilot says quietly. We did it, guys. The Walker surname has always automatically propelled him to action. He just had to go forward, strive for higher results, and not stop. As a teenager, he loved to run, arms outstretched at the sides. He imagined that his legs lifted off the ground suddenly, and he felt himself flying, soaring up both as a man and an airplane. When he worked as a test pilot, he used to fly over city lights at dusk. They assembled themselves into gigantic mosaics below and reminded him of faraway stars he wanted to reach. His dream of becoming an astronaut and getting the astronaut wings, which he considered a great honor, was born at that time. On his way to his dream, Joe studied a lot and got a bachelor's degree in physics. He also had extensive test experience in the early X-Series aircraft and 27 flights in rocket aircraft after joining the NACA, which stands for the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, in Dryden in 1951. He combined the experience with sound engineering judgment. What drives a test pilot to risk his life every day? Courage? Duty? Devotion? Passion? All of it. Joe was a talented test pilot and would not have traded jobs with anyone, but he had always aimed higher. So he became the right person for the X-15 spaceflight program when he was invited to be its chief pilot. The whole team, including the engineers and all the 12 test pilots, had to prove that they could design an airplane that would fly and survive at hypersonic speeds. Before, there was only a theory about hypersonic flight and subscale wind tunnel testing. That's why there were many questions, like, will they be able to prove it? Will they manage to design an airplane that will be stable and controllable at hypersonic speeds? Could they possibly create a structure that would survive the high heating rates associated with hypersonic speeds? And, more importantly, could a pilot survive and function adequately in this high-energy environment? When the X-15 launches from the bomber's wing, it first goes into a freefall for several seconds. And only after that, the rockets can be ignited. So there was a considerable risk of a rocket failure, too. The team also had to design an airplane that would be controllable outside the atmosphere and could successfully re-enter it at high speed and steep entry angles. If the X-15 took the wrong angle, the plane would be destroyed. So could they prove all of this? To regularly tempt fate is a real job of any test pilot. 
Joseph knew the anatomy of his winged friend as much as his own, because his life depended on it. The X-15 looked like a big propellant tank with a cockpit. It was 50 feet long, 20 feet wide, and 13 feet high. But the propellant tanks took up approximately 25 of those 50 feet. The X-15 weighed 15,000 pounds without propellants and 33,000 pounds loaded with them. The propellants consisted of liquid oxygen and anhydrous ammonia. To fly at the hypersound speed of Mach 6, or 4,000 miles per hour, one must have an airplane that will survive temperatures as high as 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. That's why the X-15 was built of steel Iconal X, a tough, high-strength nickel-steel alloy. Only three aircraft were built. The X-15 was by far the fastest plane existing at that time. It could fly at a speed of up to seven times the speed of sound, which is 4,520 miles per hour. Joseph Walker could fly to the edge of space and land again within 12 minutes. The plane was powered by a liquid rocket engine, Reaction Motors XLR-99, which delivered a powerful thrust of 57,000 pounds. During Walker's first X-15 flight, he was unaware of how much power the rocket motors had, and he was slammed into the pilot seat yelling, Oh wow! The enormous ejection seat weighed 270 pounds. It had two large stabilizing fins deployed after ejection and two large telescopic booms that extended for seat stabilization. The aircraft had a conventional wing, although small, with only a 22-foot span and roughly 200 square feet of area. The aircraft's tail was unusual, with two canted horizontal and two vertical surfaces. These tail surfaces resembled the feathers on an arrow. They served the same purpose, keeping the aircraft stable and pointed in the right direction. The upper and lower vertical tail surfaces were pretty large and thick compared to conventional airplanes. They were wedge-shaped in cross-section, with a sharp edge in front and a broad, and a broad base at the rear. This provided additional stability and prevented the aircraft from swapping ends at extremely high speeds. The airflow sensor on the airplane's nose determined the airflow direction and impact pressure. This sensor was referred to as the ball nose. It was servo-driven to align with the airflow affecting the aircraft's nose. From this, the engineers obtained the angle of attack, the side-slip inclination, and the impact pressure of the air flowing over the aircraft. The ball nose was cooled with liquid nitrogen to prevent it from melting during high-speed flight. Walker sometimes liked to playfully bet with his fellow test pilots who would be the first to lift the rocket plane above the Kármán line, the internationally accepted boundary of 62 miles. On August 22, 1963, during Flight 91, Joseph Walker sets a world record of the highest altitude of 67.08 miles reached by an unpowered plane X-15. The X-15 is hoisted up to the pylon on the B-52 wing. The hoists are located in the X-15 servicing, fueling, and mating areas. All pre-flight checks are completed. Take off. The X-15 is the first aircraft to utilize an inertial platform and a computer. Standard barometric instruments are almost useless in the X-15. Joseph has them on the instrument panel, but he only uses them during landing because they don't work at high altitudes or outside the atmosphere. For a sizable portion of the flight, he uses inertial data for control and guidance. Launch The X-15 drops away from the bomber and gets into a freefall for several seconds. Then the rockets start by burning within 85 seconds, producing extreme power. Joseph pulls the plane up at a steep climb-out angle to start forming a long parabola and comes out of the atmosphere. The pilot has good visibility since the windows are next to his head. One very unusual thing about the visibility out of the X-15's windows is that the pilot cannot see any part of the airplane. He cannot see the nose. He cannot see the wings. Nothing. Typically, pilots use the nose and the wings in an aircraft for attitude reference. In the X-15, all Joseph has for a reference is the window frame, which is very disorienting on the one hand. But on the bright side, such a panoramic view is just right to enjoy the splendid horizon a boundary between Earth and space. Joseph thinks how quiet it is here, like nowhere else. Mission completed. Joseph completes a perfect parabola and re-enters the atmosphere successfully. 
The X-15 is like a tough old bird that pops and bangs as it accelerates above extreme speed. But it all hangs together and gets Joseph Walker back home. He is ready to start a glide, landing from space. The X-15 has some outstanding features that significantly enhance the safety of landing. It has highly effective speed brakes, which are essential in an unpowered aircraft to adjust energy and ensure a pilot gets back to the ground safely. The more effective they are, the more precise the control of the power and the more accurate the landing. It's hard to imagine, but the pilot lands the X-15 only about 11 minutes and 8 seconds after its launch, having gone through the distance of 337 miles. Joseph Walker makes history as the first civilian test pilot flying to space by a rocket plane twice. Despite all the risks of the X-15 program, the courageous test pilots push the very limits of their piloting skills and physical health to master groundbreaking experimental technology. The program's overall success helped develop the space shuttle program and paved the way for NASA to continue to the moon decades later. Joseph Walker got a lot of awards and the cherished astronaut wings, but only many years later. The Lunar Landing Research Vehicle, used to develop piloting and operational techniques for lunar landings, was trusted to be piloted by Joseph. And the famous moon crater Walker was named in his honor.